Um, I do believe uh, everybody here that's going to be an oboist as an adult should learn how to do adjustments on your oboe, okay? Uh, especially if you're going to be a professional performer or teacher, uh, you're going to be in situations where you have to make these adjustments right before a concert or whatever, or for your students in, in studio. Uh, you're going to have to because your students are going to have inferior instruments a lot of times. And sometimes you'll be able to fix it, sometimes you can't, um, just because the instruments are uh, sometimes not so hot, right? So, you know, talking about the, the real younger kids that are playing on band, band instruments and stuff like that. So, um, I really think as, when you're still in high school that you should really focus on just learning the basics. So you guys really, you know, you're, you're at this camp, so you're kind of excelling already and you're learning how to make reeds already, that's, that's cool stuff. But try to keep it simple in my mind. So lots of scales, lots of metronome, um, etude books, like as much of the foundation stuff as you guys really can focus on. I started late in, like I said, I didn't start playing until I was a junior in high school. And I had a teacher right away, which was awesome. Um, but we didn't do a lot of the, the beginning scale stuff and I definitely didn't use a metronome, okay? Uh, started playing some pieces, you know, it was fun, you know, I had fun in high school doing that. But when I got to college, uh, my, one of my first lessons, Dr. Ross put on a metronome like at 70. I mean, it was like ridiculous, right? And he's like, play a C major scale with this metronome. And I couldn't do it. Like, I just had no rhythm at all, even at that slow of a tempo, because I hadn't done any of the foundation work. So. That's my recommendation for the younger players in here, the high school players, is to do as much of that as possible. You know, do your reads and stuff. But then as soon as you get in college, you need to get an oboe adjustment book and start learning. So learning ba oboe adjustments is just like making reads. Uh, it's just like working up a, a big piece that you're gonna perform. It takes time. And so if you're able to start tinkering and, and turning screws, you know, when you're young in college, hopefully by the time you graduate, you'll have a better grasp of it. Uh, hopefully uh, your teachers can help you if you do mess up something. Um, but you always pay attention to what you're doing. So if you turn a screw and it does something completely negative that you, you didn't want it to do, then you undo what you did, right? So just don't go and turn another screw, right? So you just kind of keep track of what you're doing as well and you'll have a lot of success uh, learning adjustments. Um, so. Because of that, I'm, I can't really get into the screws and the adjustments uh, with everybody here today, uh, but definitely uh, you should start learning uh, when you get into college age and just kind of let, let time be your friend, uh, just like you're doing with, with reads and um, um, practicing you know, Mozart. You know, how many has mastered the Mozart concerto yet? See, even the big time professionals in here, I didn't raise their hand, right? Because it's always in progress. You know, everything we do is always in progress. So, but, but we have to, to keep doing that every day, diligence. So, but what we can talk about um, are some of the basics. And some of you that are really highly experienced um, are probably gonna be like, oh my gosh, this is so basic. But um, I wanna go back uh, basically on how to handle and assemble your oboe. Um, I think maintenance comes down to, especially with oboes, because the, the, the mechanism is super complicated, right? Um, and so there's a lot of keys that interconnect. There's a lot of uh, adjustment materials like corks, leathers, um, stuff like that. As that stuff wears and the, the longer you play it, those pads get deeper indentions. And when that happens, you start to get leaks. So there's a lot of stuff going on. And so I think it goes back to the basics of just assembling your oboe can help you stay out of the repair shop uh, for a while, okay? Um, of course, if you play a lot, uh, you're striving to be an oboist or you're a professional already and you play four, six, eight hours a day, you're gonna have to have maintenance just because it's just, just doing this all day, um, pads and corks are just, it's just gonna wear. Uh, but if you can prevent some of the wear from happening by not squeezing the keys when you assemble it, that's really going to help you out uh, long term and stay out of the shop uh, and not have to go as often. So I didn't bring my oboe. Can I borrow somebody's? All right. Oh, yes. 
Just kidding. <laughs> uh, let's see. So, um, those of you that started, say, in middle school, um, was your band director a Yanobo player? <laughs> Tuba, percussion, brass, something like that. Some of you might have been lucky, they might have been clarinet. Yeah, so you know, if you got clarinet, usually you're in a little bit better shape, and they might actually teach you how to assemble an instrument. Um, but from what I hear when I go do these talks, a lot of times they're just not really even taught how to assemble, and if they are, in my mind, it's it's slightly inaccurate because um, it's there's more to it than just grabbing the the joints and kind of shoving it together. And one thing I do see that band, when band directors do teach it. They, a lot of times they'll say, every time you assemble, put core grease on. No. <laughs> because what happens is every time you do that, you push the, the joints together, a lot of that excess comes out and it oozes out. So, you know, a lot of you has probably uh, experienced that. And so especially uh, from the middle to the top joint, you know, if core grease is oozing out in this area, where's it going to go? What pad is right above this? Your G-sharp, right? So G sharp, we don't need, they don't need any help sticking, okay? And if they get core grease on them, they are gonna stick. So, uh, so we definitely don't apply core grease every time we assemble. Um, and we'll talk more about core grease in a minute. So assembly, uh, the way that we recommend at Onks Woodwind, basically you wanna assemble your oboe without squeezing any keys. Okay, so that's the basic principle. The way I'm gonna show you may differ from the way you end up doing it. That's totally fine. Um, but like we talked about, all the pads and all the corks that, that are um, on the instrument, every time you squeeze them, they're getting more used. I don't know what the word is, but they're getting used up, right? So you're gonna get deeper indentions in the pads. Uh, the adjustment corks are gonna hopefully, hopefully won't, but they'll break through and then uh, your adjustments go out. So, um, I'm right-handed, so I'll start with the bell in my right hand, and I'll approach the oboe from underneath, and I squeeze down here at the bottom where there's really not any keys, and so I'm squeezing from the bottom, and I'm squeezing the wood, or if you have plastic, whatever, okay? Uh, there's even a, a little post back here on this side. You know, if you feel like you need a little support, you can touch that post with your thumb. Typically, that post is not going anywhere. Sometimes it does, but typically not. Um, so squeeze there, and then the bell's pretty easy. Uh, even if you have a bell key, you don't really have to grab over that. So I'll go ahead and get it started. And then while it has a little, little bit of space there, I'll go ahead and line the, the bridge keys up, okay? And then once those are lined up, and if your oboe is in somewhat of an adjustment, when we push these together, the bridge keys should not bang together, okay? A lot of people worry about that, and that's why some people recommend you put it on and you turn it kind of in place. Um, but I've just seen too much damage from the turning motions. So I think this is uh, more beneficial you know, over the long, long term. So once you have them lined up, then you can, uh, I'll take my right hand up here on the socket and then you can use your stomach or if you're sitting down, you wanna use your knee or your leg, but just very slowly at that point. Oh. Yeah, and that way you push it and it's, it's lined up straight together, okay? And so we've done that so far with no squeezing. Then we'll go with the upper joint. Um, so at this point, I will switch out my right hand on the lower joint here, I'll squeeze. I'll go over these keys, but again, all the pressure is on the wood, so I'm not squeezing the keys, even though it sort of looks like it. Okay, and then the upper joint, uh, again from underneath, palming, and then this one has the the nice crown at the top. So really, it's just laying in my palm, and and I use a few fingers to to come around the crown at the top. Okay, and then you uh, start to assemble get it together a little bit, and then go ahead and line up your bridges. And so this bridge, in playing position, the bridge on the right side, that's the most important one, okay? 
And so I'll use that one to do my siding. And again, this is the same, so I'll just push it straight together at this point. Okay. And again, if your oboe is in adjustment, those bridge keys should not bang together. Okay. Um, anybody ever assembled their oboe and, and those bridge keys did bang together? That you know of or want to admit? <laughs> nice. Yeah. Okay. So uh, either that could have been, so like if you assemble and you're, you're twisting, um, well, so this is, it's round, right? And so if you twist and go around, it actually changes just from the nature of a curve, a circle, those relationships can change. So a key can be higher or lower. And so, um, and if the elbow wasn't an adjustment, uh, those, those keys will definitely uh, bang together. So. Uh, again, we just don't recommend twisting hardly at all. And then disassembling. Disassembling, you will need to twist a little bit sometimes just to kind of break the seal. Uh, and so I'd recommend, again, hold it the, cr the crown at the top. And then I'll do just a slight turn. I mean, it's, I don't know, the bridge keys are still overlapping. So it's just a tiny, tiny bit of a turn. I don't know if anybody can see that. And so that kind of helps break the seal after you play. And then we'll do the same thing, but the other way. Yeah. Okay, just a tiny bit. And you can do that until it gets loose enough, then pull it straight apart, okay? <clears throat> and then of course, taking the bell off, kind of the same thing, grabbing the same spot and just a light twist. And a lot of times this one, you can continue to go twist around, just be wary of of those bridge keys until that comes off. Voila, I'm a magician. <laughs> Y'all have any uh, comments about that or horror stories about assembling or like you guys, this is totally laid back, so you're welcome to chat it up or. So if the cork is too uh, big, would you sand it or how would you go about? So we would. Um, and so I'm going to use your oboe as a demonstration here in a moment as well. I think some of the tightness on yours is because we have some dirt buildup. Okay, so we'll talk about that when we get into the core grease part. Um, but yeah, so that could be one of the scenario is that the cork is just simply too big. And a lot of times uh, if you're trying a brand new instrument and it's right out of the box from a, man a manufacturer, a lot of times they are a bit snug. Uh, sometimes they're just downright impossible to put together. Um, and yeah, I don't know, they just do that because they know they're going to travel and going to go to different climates or whatever, but you know, and they don't want to make them super, you know, easy or loose, you know, before they sell them because they could be too loose by the time they get to a dealer or the, the end customer. So anyway, so that's a, a very common scenario. We do a lot of new instrument setups. We work closely with Hannah's Oboes in Arizona. And uh, so we do a lot of new instrument setups uh, for her and we see that all the time for sure. Um, Fox, Howarth, I mean, every brand really does it to be honest with you. So um, yeah, cool. Um, yeah, and, and sandpaper wise, uh, in our shop, we have uh, rolls of sandpaper. It's like a cloth paper, it's about one inch wide. And so we have just long strips that we can take and then we can rip those strips to be a little bit narrower. And so we kind of have like, you know, the sand belt motion, you know, that we can do to, to sand those down and, and kind of keep it kind of even and, and look nice. And then of course, if we're replacing a cork in our shop, uh, we use a, we spin the joints on a wood lathe. And so we, as it's spinning, we, we sand it that way it's completely round and uniform and the, the cork looks nice and beautiful. Um, yeah, for that. Cool. Any other commentaries? No, no. All right. Um, so the next one, uh, also deals with handling. Um, and those of you that are still in high school, I don't know if you get breaks, um, and during band or orchestra, do y'all have an orchestra or a band or? And so you have like super long practices or are they just like an hour? Yeah. yeah. And do they get like a, a break in the middle somewhere to water break or something? Yeah, we get a 20 minute break. 
okay. So what do you do with your oboe during your 20 minute break? I usually just swab it. Okay. And then what? Very good intuition. So we see oboes all the time. Um, they've been knocked over. Uh, of course, in the flute world, you see flutes that, uh, as my flute repair guy friend said, they smile at you, uh, right? <laughs> flute players, they'll, since flutes are metal, they set them in their chair, somebody sits on them, uh, and they kind of turn into a smiley face. Uh, oboes, oboes will not do that. However, oboes, uh, the, the center tendon here uh, will snap off, right? Because it, it can't bend like metal, uh, but it will break. Uh, this, anywhere you have these tendons, those are weak, spo uh, weak points on the oboe. And so if they take a hit, uh, any kind of major stress, they can and will break. Uh, even if they're really nice ones like this with the, the double metal ferrules on here, um, you know, those break off just as easy as, as plastic or just wood ones, okay? Um, so your intuition is great. Um, my basic principle for handling your oboe, if you are not playing your oboe currently in your hands, playing it, it should be in its case. Hands down, plain and simple, okay? Now I know that's not practical, right? But if you want to stay out of the repair shop, that's one way that you can stay out of the repair shop for a longer period of time, okay? Um, I've even seen it uh, in professional playing when I played. You have a, a break in orchestra and you put your oboe on a stand. You got the nice double stand if your oboe English horn and you walk away. And then the brass player behind you is talking with his buddy and he's turned around. He doesn't see your instrument and your instruments fall over. Okay. I've seen or brass guy, you know, the brass people, they just intrigue me. They'll set their trombone on the floor. Yeah, that's what we do. Right? We so floor. we definitely don't do that with our oboes. Um, Except we don't set our mouthpiece on the floor for some strange reason. Right? They take, yeah, they take the mouthpiece off, put it on the floor, and then put it on their trombone. Yeah. At least that's what they're supposed to do. Right. So um, it's not practical. But if we're, if we're kind of going by principles that will help us uh, keep our oboes maintained and out of the shop, if you're not actively playing your oboe, it really should be in its case, okay? If you are in high school and you have like an hour band, you probably won't have a break, right? Because schools, the school schedules are ridiculous nowadays, right? So, you know, my daughter just graduated high school and she said she barely had time to, you know, walk to the next class. You know, she wasn't even, she wasn't in band, so I can't imagine if you're an oboe player in high school needing time to soak your reed and, you know, it's just, it's crazy. So, um, in all that hurried world though, um, if you don't, if there is a break and you don't have time to put it away because it's like super quick break, the oboe should go with you in your hand, right? And you should never invite your friend to hold your oboe for you especially if your friend is a flute player or a trumpet player, because while you're off taking care of your needs during the break, they're going to be playing your uh, or spinning your oboe like a baton uh, or something like that, right? Uh, if, if it's not your property, you feel um, more at liberty to play with things, right? It's, so I just think that uh, keeping it in your hand or in the case Again, that's not completely practical, but keeping it in your hand probably is more practical, right? Uh, if you're at home and you're practicing a long session, uh, you know, a nice sturdy tabletop or something, or even a, an oboe stand if you want to walk away for a few minutes is fine, unless, who has cats? <clears throat> yeah, cats are bad for oboes, okay? Uh, who has toddlers? Not many of you probably. <laughs> Toddlers are bad for oboes. Okay. When I was, do well, so dogs can be bad. It depends on the nature of your dog. Okay. Uh, a lot of times dogs don't care. You know, they just leave things alone for the most part. But, but cats are like really, they just like go to jump and they could brush it as they're jumping up on the table next to it. 
or if you do have it on a nice big sturdy tabletop and they jump up on the table with it and start playing with your oboe, um, cats are bad. Cat fur is even more worse. So like, don't let your cat lay in your oboe case or even a dog for that matter or a hedgehog or a guinea pig, it doesn't matter. You know, no animal dander or hair in your cases. I mean, we've seen some, I've seen some real, yeah, like people think it's cute. They're practicing and they're in, they're, their animal is laying next to them in their case. It's a good, it's a good Instagram pic, right? It's not, it's not a good for, for oboe maintenance. I have a question. Yeah. Do you recommend a type of oboe stand? Because I've noticed sometimes I feel like some of them like wear down and they like, kind of like cause like scratching. I, d I don't. I mean, yeah, if, if you buy a stand and the, the peg, you know, if it seems like it's going to, you don't want that, right? You don't want it scratching. Um, no, I mean, even the really super cheap plastic ones that, that fold, that come apart, like, and then they lay flat. Uh, I mean, in the right context, those are fine. Um, obviously, the, there are brands that are like a Hercules brand or, you know, one of these other ones that are like super beefy. Uh, with kind of wide bases and rubber feet on them, you know, those would be more safe. Uh, but really, it goes back to the principle. Uh, you know, how, how often do you want to go to the, emer the emergency room? <laughs> how often do you want to go to the oboe emergency room uh, because your cat knocked your, your oboe over? So even on a nice stand, that could still happen. Um, so we just want to take all of that risk out of the equation um, as much as possible. So, um, yeah, so, so keep the oboe in your hand or in the case, uh, especially when you're in high school. I, I talk about that a lot because um, I was once a high school boy and I was not responsible. And if I knocked your clarinet over or your whatever, you know, just one of those things that happens, oh well. Um, and, you know, you're not, not paying attention like you should. So, um, Anybody have any horror stories of their oboes being knocked over? Oh yeah, I have one. That's really bad. Yeah? It wasn't even knocked over. Some person decided to pull a prank on me by, you know, I had one of those flip cases, so you had to flip both of them up to open the case. And one person decided to flip one up, and I didn't know when I was carrying it, the other one got unhooked and opened, and it fell on the floor. Yikes. Yeah. Yeah, that person would not have been my friend. No, they weren't my friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it was my senior concerto in high school, and it was the first time I was premiering my oboe because I, I just got a new one. And um, so I, they asked me to come, all the concerto final, or the concerto people, performers, they asked them to come up to the front of the stage to get like applause. So I left my oboe on the, the purple array stand, and the second chair oboe kicked it, and oh. like literally like skidded across the floor. <laughs> and we got it on camera, and it was just so awful. <laughs> and it, it, that, that oboe never worked since, so I had I finally got this one like a year ago. So. <laughs> oh my and I had to go my whole like three years of college. So. <laughs> It was awful. But you had done, you've already, you did, at that point, you did your performance. Yes. Right, right. So at least the, <laughs> that, that, uh, that was, disaster was diverted. Wow. Yeah, those are good ones. So, so yeah, it could even, like, that was a total accident. Yeah. Well, he obviously, <laughs> yeah, he obviously didn't mean to, like, hey, I'm going to get this guy, <laughs> you know. So, uh, yeah. So even, like, your oboe people that are next to you that, that should know better as well, you know, stuff happens. And so most of the time it is going to be an accident. You know, even your high school buddies are not going to intentionally, unless they're using your oboe like a baton, that's, that's pretty intentional. But um, yeah, so again, in your hands or in the case, that would take all that. Like if you would have walked out with that in your hand, that would not have happened, right? So you want to minimize risk at all possibilities. And so practically, it's not the best thing, but it's, that's what's going to keep you out of the shop, okay? Uh, okay, laying your oboe down. So this is another uh, easy one. So um, how many in here love playing low B flats? You like play low B flat concerto because it's so easy, right? <laughs> right? Uh, right, right. 
So if you have a good oboe and a good reed, like low B flats, you just, you know, for the most part, they just come right out like any other note, okay? But especially for our younger crowd, uh, sometimes it can be a challenge, and even for adults, uh, professionals or adult amateurs, it can be, uh, can be challenging if you don't have a great read that day. Um, but what can make it even more challenging is when levers get bent and the low B and the B flat are not in regulation at all, and then you have almost no possibility of getting that low B flat to sound when you need it, okay? You're shaking your head. What happened? Terrifies me. Yeah. I don't set my oboe like that because. Okay. Good. Do you want to demonstrate how to set your oboe down? I just I don't set it down. Oh, you don't set it down. <laughs> okay. Well, that's a great principle to live by. Don't set your oboe down. <laughs> if you had to do it, you do it on the side with the right hand D flat keys because they're stronger and they don't bend as much. That's a good reason. So the other reason I do that. So she is right. If you do set your oboe down on a tabletop or something, you want to set it on the right side in plain position like this. So yes, the, like if this E flat key were to lay on the table, um, you know, unless you slammed it down, it's not really going to get bent or do any damage, right? And this, uh, this side G sharp uh, little trill lever thingy over here, you know, that's pretty beefy. It's not going anywhere if, if you lay it nicely on a tabletop. However, if you lay your oboe on the left side on the tabletop, um, I don't really have a good place to demonstrate, but you guys can see this happen. You ready? <laughs> but if you lay it this way, what's the first thing it hits? Right? I mean, that's just pretty obvious, right? And so it doesn't take much for those, that lever to get bent, and then all of a sudden your low B and B flat are not going to be regulated. Um, and if that were to happen right before a concert or something, you'd, you'd probably have no, no option but to either skip the note or, I don't know, sing it instead, uh, something like that. So uh, when you're laying your oboe, and I see this, oh, you guys, I love Instagram. And if you're on Instagram, you need to follow us at Onks Woodwind, okay? Get your phones out right now. <laughs> uh, joking, but not really. Anyway, so I follow lots of oboe people, obviously, on Instagram, and I see this all the time. Everybody's posting their beautiful oboe pics. You know, they wait for the perfect time of day. The sunlight's coming through the window. It's like the perfect IG picture. And they're laying their oboe on the left side, and these levers are just going up. And I'm like, oh. Sometimes I comment, I'm like, hey, just so you should know, you should lay your robe on the right. Sometimes I do. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to help people, right? So sometimes I do, a lot of times I don't. But um, yeah, so uh, yeah, don't do that. Okay, swabbing and feathering. Everybody swabs or feathers, right? Okay. Um, how many of you exclusively use a, swab, a feather? Not all the time. Not all the time. Maybe sometimes. Uh, the rest of the time you're swabbing. Just sometimes. Yeah. When I just want to yeah. Is your swab available quickly? I think mine is deep in that box. I don't know, or if somebody else has a swab out, but. Um, so we all, I, I think. I'm a swabber, I've always used a swab, and that is because my teacher, primary teachers, Dan Ross and Nancy King use swabs, right? I think a lot of us kind of do what our teachers do. Um, and there's, this is one of these things that uh, will never be solved in the, the instrument or the oboe world is what is better, what's better, swabbing or feathering, and why we would do that. Um, but what, no matter what you choose, it has to be done. Uh, if you don't and you just put your instrument away, that moisture stays in there, um, you know, wood could swell. Uh, if worst case, you know, you get a lot of uh, moisture uh, on the pads and et cetera, those are going to swell, obviously. Your pads are not going to cover. It's just not good to keep all that excess moisture in your instrument. So you guys are all aware of that. Um, yes, sir. 
What's your opinion of the dirt track theory? The what? Dirt track theory. Dirt track. Um, I don't know of the theory per se, but well, I. My teacher, Bill Chris, he was a student at Tabitha, went to Hans Medic. And I don't know if Hans Medic is interested, but my teacher would drop water in the top shot down the back. Yeah. And he'd do this over three or four days. He'd, he'd, and not swab it out. So it builds up this track going down. Yeah, so like, yeah, water track, yeah. And he, he said that that prevented elbows. But um, when I stayed with him, this was probably like 74, 75. Yeah. He had like three, three elbows. And he, he was a big player in LA. So, um, but it was like, um, in my mind, I'm going, one, you use feathers and you have all these cracked elbows. And, and he tells me about the, the dirt track thing. I just wondered if you had ever heard of that, where people try to build the lines for the water yeah. on the back. Um, I've definitely heard of it. I've even done it for a few people. Um, some people do it with oil. Do you think it works? Not necessarily. <laughs> um, so anytime we're adding more moisture to the instrument, there's a possibility of collecting more dirt. So when you said dirt track, that's kind of what you end up with um, in my mind is so I try not to add anything to an oboe. I just, you know, I want to get it nice and clean and keep it clean and, and not add stuff. Uh, people add stuff all the time. And the theory is absolutely correct that if you kind of do that water trail or even an oil trail and, and you let it dry, you know, don't mess around, don't move the oboe, let it dry in that position that you're kind of uh, pre-making a well a track right and so any moisture that you put into your instrument by playing it is going to go to that track and just kind of follow it nicely in a single file line going down the oboe um, and we all know that doesn't happen right as soon as you do that the next day you're going to get water in your f key or something you know it's just there's there's nothing predictable about what we do um, you might you might do it and then you might not get water in your oboe at all for a week or two and you're like oh it's the magic trick and then as soon as you think that you get water in your oboe so um you know doing that with water and doing a track if you want to do it i don't think it's not going to harm anything um, uh, so feel free to to try that um, i don't practice that you know in our shop we don't do that like a standard thing or anything like that we just we just like to get things super clean um, and then hopefully you won't have water issues that way and so kind of off track but talking about the water thing so if you're playing a lot and there's a lot of moisture in your oboe you don't want to turn your oboe over right so if you turn your oboe although that moisture track is going to follow the curve and it's just going to go straight in your tone holes and then you are going to have major water issues it's once it's there it's hard to get out we're all aware of that okay um and then uh, one trick trick that you can do i've uh, mentioned a few times i studied with dan ross and his theory of why so many oboes crack around the trills is that when you're swabbing your instrument out a lot of times we don't play the trills right i mean you know there's specific pieces we use it on but you know, you could go weeks or months without ever trilling uh, with the C sharp or the D trill, right? Uh, and so you could have a long practice session and moisture can get up in there. And it and because those trills are never opened, it kind of creates a vacuum-like environment, even though it's not a vacuum. Okay, and so that moisture, because the trills are not opening, just hangs up in there. And so even though you swab or use a feather, the swab and the feather, they're not going up into the tone holes. And so that moisture stays in, and sits up in there. And so um, what Dr. Ross did and I did uh, my whole career when I had a, a solid wood oboe, I would take uh, like the, a, a cardboard from a razor blade or something and I would kind of place it in between uh, the trill levers and the feet of the trill. So kind of like down in that space. And by putting that little razor blade cardboard in there, that would prop those trills open. And if there's any moisture in there, theoretically that would dry out and or fall out or dry out. Um, 
and he said that was the trick. He hardly ever had oboes crack, and um, I never had one crack myself. It doesn't mean anything. Um, my teacher, Nancy King, never had oboes crack, and then one time she bought one and it cracked pff, instantly. You know, so it's, again, there's nothing absolute uh, in our industry, okay? But there, there are things that seem to help people, and whether that's a water track or if that's propping uh, trill keys open, uh, there's lots of things you can try. And so as long as it doesn't actually have a, a large negative effect on your instrument, you know, it's, there's no harm in trying, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty open with lots of stuff, so. Where would you put the carbon? Yeah, so it goes kind of in between oh, okay. the lever and the foot, mm -hmm. that little space. I've seen someone do that before, I don't remember who. Was it Phil Ross? Probably, yeah, because he was like, yeah, I keep like yeah. carbon. So like, yeah, like in there. You just got to remember to take it out before you assemble it. <laughs> <laughs> before you even try to assemble the yobo, because then your bridge keys could bang together, uh, for sure. Uh, but that little space you could put that I don't know if you guys could see that there's that little space between the levers and the feet of the trill keys Can you see that Jason would you recommend that also for uh, the second octave key if you're getting water in the second octave key just to prop that open uh, you could that would not hurt as well um, you know if you're having water issues in both octave keys it would be hard to kind of get them both propped open just just because of the way the mechanism works but yeah sure sure and i see a lot of people you know when they pack their elbows away they'll put cigarette paper under that pad maybe they're maybe they think they're doing it for water issues which they could be but i think also uh, these octopads uh, can wear very quickly just the nature of them um, it, whether you actually accidentally grab because we're not going to grab here anymore right cause when we assemble uh, but yeah, if you push, put too much pressure here, or just the nature of those keys and the way they operate, um, and the fact that they're sitting on top of a metal vent, they're not sitting on wood or plastic uh, like the rest of your oboe. And sometimes, depending on the brand, some of those metal vents actually are pretty sharp. They come up to a nice, fine tone hole point, um, and those points literally can just cut into the, those cork pads uh, which obviously will cause leaking. Um, and so if you wanted to also to help um, discourage those pads wearing uh, quickly, uh, you could take just a little square of cigarette paper and just put it under between the vent and the, and the pad when you store your oboe away. And that'll take some of the pressure, just that the nature of that paper, mm -hmm. it'll take some of the pressure off of that pad on that metal tone hole. So that's a, an, an alternate reason that you might see people do that as well, um, which is a, a very real thing for sure. Because um, also, let me see. yeah, so I think yours is, is doing this right now. So because those, the cork pads are nice and soft and they're sitting on that metal vent, over time they get that deep indention. Um, the nature of the second octave key this lever back here, once that pad indents and compresses, that lever comes down and hits the body. And then at that point, that pad's not covering anymore. And I think yours is doing that. So we can definitely take care of that for you uh, after a while. So one more question. How often would you prop the, the trill keys open? Did you do it all the time? Or yeah. All the time? When I did it, every time I got through playing, I would do that. It was just part of, just like Suave, and I would do that. Yeah. I didn't quite understand. Did you do it under the under the pad or just in a way? No. If, can you you want to look? So you can see how the the trill levers right. and the trill key itself they meet right there, and there's that space. Right. So I just slip that that cardboard down in there. Down where? In that space right oh, here. Oh, in the space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Okay. And that'll put the lever will put pressure on the cardboard, I and then you. that puts pressure on the feet, and that'll they'll just prop open. Okay. Yeah, and you might have to fold the cardboard, the razor blade cardboard over in two. Um, and cause I'm like, I'm really like high maintenance and, and anal and stuff. So I would like wrap mine with tape and make it look pretty and stuff. And, but anyway, that was me. Um, cool. So uh, we didn't get to the swabbing. So how many of you got your swab stuck that are swab users? Uh, more than once. More than once? Oh my goodness. Thank you for being honest today. 
<laughs> okay, so I did get my swab stuck once as well. Um, and uh, people say don't use swabs because you get your swab stuck. So, you know, I don't know. I'm not going to tell you to use a feather or a swab or what, you know, use whatever you're taught, use whatever you're comfortable with. Um, but I think if you follow my simple little method here, uh, that you should be able to swab the rest of your life and never get an oboe swab stuck in your oboe, okay? Um, and before I show you this, alternative ways to do that, um, there are nowadays non-pull-through swabs. So this one is a pull-through swab. It has an extra little string on the back side. Uh, theoretically, if it does start to get stuck, uh, at that point you can take the oboe apart and pull the, obo the swab back out. If you have a non-pull through swab, you would pull the, pull the swab through till it gets nice and snug, uh, and then just pull it back out, right? Uh, alternatively, you can use the feather, right? If you get a feather stuck, God bless you. <laughs> okay, but so they can, break off. they can break off. Absolutely, and it, and there's always a situation. Right, right, absolutely. I've heard of that. Yeah. Do you feel that the swab enlarges the bore with repeated use? I do feel that over time that can happen. So do you think the feather? But the feather has a hard spine on it, so it's gonna. Too, it can. It can. Don't swap out the instrument, probably save the <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It might have a bacterial contamination or something, but <laughs> yeah. No, you've got to you've got to clean your instrument, and so there's always going to be a negative effect from that. Okay. Uh, and there's going to be some other negative effects that we'll talk about. Um, if you wanted to. So if you keep an oboe and play it for 20 years or 30 years and you swab every single day, this, the nature of the swab pulling through and rubbing that bore, it's going to enlarge. All materials wear. Okay? So, you know, you've seen the, the water dropping on a rock. Over time, even a rock will wear from a simple drip of water. Okay? So it's, it's no different from plastic, from wood. You pull this through. Um, I did have a Lore Obo for 20 years that I played and I swabbed and I did take measurements and it did get bigger, okay? Um, so it does happen. How many of you are gonna play professionally and keep an oboe for 20 years? <laughs> so I don't think it's a reason not to swab, but it could be helpful to not swab and have that not happen. It's just a decision you have to make. But over a year or two, it's not going to happen. And so if you, if you do play professionally and, and are going to be doing that, and you know, it's not necessarily something you have to worry about too much. Uh, but you could also, uh, besides using the non-pull through, a don't pull it super tight. Just pull it till it's a little bit loose. Pull it back out. You could also do the same thing with the pull through, is not pull the pull through all the way through and that would relieve some of that tension on the bore. So there are ways to help minimize uh, that wear. Um, you know, just the, the more pressure that's inside with swabs, uh, the more that will happen over time for sure. Yes? Um, so I've always wondered, I just kind of buy myself a new swab every year. Sure. But should we be cleaning it, like washing it? Or Excellent question. Thank you. You should. So, okay, I've got to go back. So I'll answer your question, then we'll go back. I got to show you guys how to swab. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, we recommend in our shop annual maintenance, okay? And so one of the reasons why, um, and actually today's post on Instagram, if you go there, is a perfect picture example of why you should have your instrument maintained. Um, when we do an annual clean in our shop, we take it completely apart and wash the body, right? Wash the tone holes and wash the bore and the, the whole thing. And the reason we do that is because when you swab every day or use a feather, it doesn't matter, 
When you're swabbing your feathers sitting around, it's collecting microscopic dust particles. So washing your swab as regularly as you feel like you want to, whether that's once a week or once a month, whatever, you can just rinse it out in your kitchen sink with Dawn liquid. Um, I guess you could throw it in your washing machine, but you might want to put it in something. That, that could get dangerous probably. Put it in a sock or something. Um, they sell like little delicates, like a zipper thing. Like oh, okay. You can throw it in the wash. Yeah. So you could buy your, go to the store and buy a delicate bag and, and put your swab in there. Um, or you can just simply wash it out in the kitchen sink, put a little Dawn on it, uh, scrub it real good, um, then let it dry out. And so that will help minimize the, just the miscellaneous dirt buildup um, that gets on the swab just from the environment. Um, again, if you have pets in the house, the, the microscopic debt pander, you know, it's all gonna get here, right? It's all gonna get in here, just like it gets all over your furniture. You're not getting away from it. Um, <clears throat> So even if you wash your swab though over a period of a year or two years when you're playing a lot and swabbing a lot those little microscopic particles as you're pulling the swab through cleaning the moisture out those particles break off and and go up inside into the tone holes uh, and attach to the moisture that's not getting swabbed out and then that moisture dries or evaporates and then that dust and dirt stays there in the evaporated moisture okay um, and it gets really bad when you can take the keys off and you look down in the tone hole and there's this brown ring. Okay, we see it every day, every week. Okay, and that's just from repeated swabbing or feathering uh, and dust and dirt getting trapped in that moisture that's not being cleaned out. So even though you're swabbing, you're not getting all of it. I mean, it's, there's always going to be moisture in your oboe after you play it and swab. Uh, so today's Instagram post is a picture where I washed an oboe and so the suds coming up through the tone holes are brown okay and so that was kind of a prime example you can actually see the dirt and dust coming out of an oboe um, also um, if you go to our website you can search for dirty oboe dirty clean oboe I did a YouTube video uh, where I showed before and after you know right away it's like I don't know, two minute three minute video where I talk about that. And, and that oboe in that video was an extreme case. Your oboe is not gonna look like that oboe uh, over a period of a year. Uh, that oboe had not been clean for like uh, five or six years and it was a professional player, like they play all the time and it was, it was kind of quite dirty. Uh, but those are examples of stuff that we've documented so you guys can see that. How do you wash the oboe? Um, well, we take all the keys off and then we just have a sink with brushes and water and Dawn detergent. Wow. Yeah. So the brushes don't scratch the wood? Nope. So what do you do after you dry it off and then you oil it? Yeah. Do you use a bath of oil or something to get it? No, we just do a light oiling, uh, just like with a feather or whatever. And, um, on the outside? Yeah. Inside too. Yeah. I mean on the outside, how, how do you... Do you just put, wipe the oil off? Yeah, it doesn't take long. It's so as fast as we're washing, like it's not drying the oboe out, right? Uh, if you have a, a regular Grenadilla oboe, Grenadilla is super dense wood. So, I mean, you're not going to dry the oboe out with a 30 second bath wash. Um, now the outside wood could look dry. And so just like if, when your hands get dry, you put lotion on we re-moisturize it with more oil and then it just let it sit for a few minutes and then we have some uh, some cloth that we kind of rag the bodies and you know it blends in and, and it would bring it right back to the way it looks right here without like literally soaking overnight or anything like that so um, yeah good question so we do uh, for wooden instruments we do uh, do that as well uh, during the cleaning process Like I find if I, if I start making a lot of reeds or if I have to start tractors a lot, from the bunch of roses, all of a sudden I, I have water, a ton of water. Yeah. At the sea hole, usually starts for this. Yeah. Or the, the octaves, and it's just like, is there any, 
There is no preventive thing. That's what I'm saying. That's in from my mind, uh, from what I've seen, and for the past uh, 14 years as being an obo specialist, I've I don't see anything that prevents anything. Um, I do believe in oiling for the sake of moisturizing the wood over a long period of time. I do feel that if you oil your instrument inside and out, and you were to keep that instrument for a long period of time, that you would retain some of that nice timbre sound that you loved when you bought the oboe originally. Yes, ma'am. Would you reckon like doing like the almond oil through like maybe once a year? Or how often should you do that? That would be fine. It would be fun. I mean, we do, like, if you do an annual maintenance with us, I mean, we are oiling it when it's in the shop. And so a lot of people do do that just once a year uh, through our maintenance. Um, but, yeah, you're, you're welcome to do that on your own. Um, I used to use sweet almond oil. It's fine. It does go bad. It goes rancid over time. So if you buy it and do it on your own, you want to buy a small container. It will last a very long time. If you can buy, I don't even know if you can buy a small container. Anyway. When we bought it in college, it was like these big bottles, like pint bottles or something. But you, know, you could never use that much oil um, ever in your life. Uh, so it just takes a tiny, tiny bit. Um, so yes, you, you can do that. And I have on my information, I have on my information, on my website, I have information on how we recommend oiling bores and, and the bodies. Um, um, yeah, so back to the, the oiling. Um, yeah, I think it does preserve the nature of the wood. Um, theoretically, oil repels water. So you would think if you oil your instrument, it's going to repel the water. It's going to go down the bore and out the bell. Um, I don't necessarily think that's true. Uh, it does repel water, but oil at the exact same time is attracting dust and dirt. Dust and dirt attracts water. So everything we do, in my opinion, there's catch-22, okay? We have to swab because you don't want to leave the moisture in your oboe, but over time your oboe is going to get dirty because of that. I think if you believe in oiling, it's a good thing, but it can have a negative effect over time because the oil is going to attract the dust and the dirt, okay? Uh, I've even heard of people, when they clean octave vents, they would lightly put a coating of oil in the, in the well down in there because water or, uh, oil repels water and that's going to keep water out of your octave vent but it attracts dust and dirt and so when I've taken instruments out like a uh, part like that it's just they're always clogged just like people that don't do it so um, I really there's no absolutes I've said it so many times today already um, so I think that covered a lot of that swabbing um, so we all know we should look at our swab first, make sure there's no knots uh, in, the, in, the in the swab, in the instrument either. Um, so if you swab with your instrument uh, fully assembled, uh, which is usually how I did it, so you'd obviously start that slowly, let it pull through, right? This is a no-brainer for all of us. So this is where a lot of people make the mistake though. So you're at the end of a rehearsal or something or uh, even at home, you're practicing and you're, you're in a hurry, you got to go somewhere or something. And at this point, you stop looking because the oboe has no knots and it's through the oboe at this point. You stop paying attention. And then you jerk it fast to pull the, the swab through fast. And what happens is it will knot up on itself. And then before you know it, it's pulling through and it's stuck right there. Okay? So, and if you have this swab, if it gets stuck right there, you can take it apart and then it's sticking out here even if it's um, yeah so even if it got stuck further up right theoretically the string is going to save us okay nick and i have seen and we cannot explain this at all but um, we have seen many stuck swabs both strings coming out the top The swab is stuck inside the oboe, extremely tight. We cannot see or get to it from this way. 
yet both strings are coming out the top? Answer me that one. I've seen it more than once. That is a talented swabber, I will have to say. Um, so, and I can't explain it other than you have to pay attention. Like, you wouldn't drive your car and close your eyes and go to sleep on purpose. Okay? You have to pay attention. You have to be in the moment. Those of you that are Zen and do yoga or meditation, you have to be in the moment and you cannot stop looking at what you're doing. And so you must literally just like stare at it and just pull it very slowly. And if you do that and there's no knots very slowly, you should never ever get your robo stuck, uh, swab stuck, okay? Um, but I think what happens, especially with our younger oboe players that are in uh, high school band or orchestra or community youth orchestras in our cities, uh, they'll be putting their instrument away and they'll talk into their neighbor or something. And so they're, they're swabbing and they're talking and not, not looking. And that's when it, when it happens. Um, so uh, just be diligent, take your time, uh, and look, look at what you're doing. Any, any, anybody want to share a story on their stuck swab? It is terrifying when it happens. Right? You're, oh my God. And then I've seen it where dads will take a drill oh, yeah. and fill it out, or they take an ice pick and try to jam it down, and they go into the side of the wall of the oboe. Yeah. It's, it's horrendous when it happens. So, yeah, it's horrendous when it gets stuck and you're scared out of your mind as the player. And then you take it to the band director or you take it to whoever and then they start to approach it from the top with a drill or an ice pick. Exactly. He's exactly correct. Uh, it's, and that's way more terrifying. Uh, we have seen many damaged oboes. Um, uh, yeah. Wait, so how do you guys get it out? I can't tell you. <laughs> we burn it out. I'm just kidding. <laughs> We had a colleague that did that. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I made a jig that I do use a drill when they are super, super tight. And so I made a jig that I can drill, but literally I'm drilling like a 32nd of an inch into it. All the, the pressure and where it's the most compact is right at the bottom of the reed well. And if you can relieve just a little bit of that pressure, then it comes right out. Um, so you don't like, so when you hear drilling it out, it doesn't like, you're not drilling all the way, like through the bore. It's like, and so I made the jig that goes into this reed well that keeps the drill perfectly centered. And of course the drill is, is way undersized. So even if it got a hair off center, it's still not going to touch the bore. And all I have to do is just go in just a tiny bit, like a 32nd of an inch. And that will usually pull out enough material that relieves that that pressure and then it can be pulled out at that point um, but i always try i have a another tool that i made that i can approach from the bottom that just has a little hook that's not going to scratch stuff people i've seen uh wherever but they'll do like a wood screw on the top of a rod theoretically right you could turn that wood screw into the swab and then pull it out it never works that way so the, the wood screw obviously scratches up the bore and, and gouges it out and damages it. So, you know, we don't do any of that stuff, but I have a really tiny hook that doesn't have any sharp edges on it. And usually you can sometimes grab some of that material and, and pull it out if it's not super compacted uh, at the top. So we always try that first, obviously, but um, yeah. So the screw, the tool that Forrest sells, you can use touch clauses, a rod with a screw on the end thing. And you can thread it into the thing. You don't. You don't recommend doing that. I've never seen that tool, um, but I have seen. I've seen homemade versions. Uh, no. Yeah. This. I mean. I, I haven't seen that one, so I can't say. Yeah. So the side of that screw, if it's got the the ridges from the screw, that's gonna potentially do as much damage as as anything else. So. Yeah, I, but I, like I said, I haven't seen that design. Maybe they designed it where it can't damage. I'm not sure. No, it's just a screw. Just a screw, yeah. It's expensive. Because you can't. It's an expensive tool. 
how can you how can you know you keep that screw perfectly centered so you're not touching the bore that's 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 where it gets so you think you're centered and then as soon as you start turning to try to go into the swab it goes off center yeah. because there's nothing to center it so if there was some way to center that tool it probably could be effective and you could probably get away with it until the bore gets down to four and a half millimeters here and the screw is six millimeters that would not work so yeah that's <laughs> similar to what i use yes oh, oh yeah that's actually better than what i i'm gonna get one of those <laughs> yeah no that's great yeah yeah that's perfect it's a Luke they want you to pass it around. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a great tool. So I have a another tool that's very similar to that. Um, it's not as long as that one, so I had to I had to braise uh, my tool that I bought onto like a brass rod to make it longer. But yeah, that's essentially, that's essentially it. Um, and so if it's, so if, if you're in the scenario where the swab starts to get stuck and you stop pulling instantly, that tool would probably uh, get it out. Um, if you do not stop pulling and you think you can pull the swab through, that tool will probably not get it out. Because um, when you really tug on them, the forces, it's so tight in there, like it's, it's unbelievable. So, cool. What is, in your opinion, when people elbow us through our great mechanics, what's the worst thing that they do to their elbows that you go, oh my gosh, how could you have been so silly to do this? So, I mean, like, say it again. Like, elbows like to repair their own elbows. Right. Or adjust their own elbows. Yeah. So what's the worst thing, what, what are some things we could do not to do so we don't have to come to you and say, mm -hmm. Look what we've done to our home. And what's the, some of the worst things that you've seen? Well, to put your mind at ease, if you did something that you were ashamed of and you came to our shop, we're not going to shame you. <laughs> not while you're there, right? Not while you're there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. As you're walking out the door, I'm going to take a video. That dude, you won't believe what he did. <laughs> um. But yeah, so what, if you're so, you know, so that's how I learned, right? I was a oboe student. I wanted to be a professional player, and that's how I learned to do this. I just started repairing on my own. So um, if you feel mechanically minded and want to try uh, changing like tenon corks or adjustment corks, or or if you just want to take it apart so you can clean the tone holes, you know, and you feel comfortable, I, I'm all for it. Uh, I encourage people to do that. If you do not feel like you were a mechanically minded person and you could not take the light plate switch off the wall, I would not recommend that you try. Okay? There are just some absolutes. <laughs> there are some absolutes. And if, if, you, if you can't figure out how to unscrew those screws, you probably don't need to, uh, to take your oboe apart. Um, but a lot of us in here are probably adventurous and want to learn more about our oboe and your mechanism, uh, which is why I recommend as a young college student that you really start learning the, the adjustments. Um, you should do that. Trying to answer his question, um, you know, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of mechanism and a lot of keys that overlap on the oboe. And one thing that, that Nick and I fight all the time, we're looking for like the perfect material that is super solid, yet super quiet, that lasts a long time. Uh, and so, and what I'm talking about is all the little corks that go under the screws. So when you make the adjustments, um, so we see a lot of uh, people that have done their own repair or uh, it's been in another shop where those little adjustment corks are really thick, like really thick pieces of cork. And thick cork on an oboe for adjustment screws is bad because what it's going to do is going to those it's going to make the adjustment squishy. So instead of when you put your third finger down, left hand to play a G natural, instead of that G natural just popping out nicely, you're going to have to squeeze through it. 
And if, and if your oboes have ever been, like, say, over-adjusted or, or not adjusted right, you might feel that you have to squeeze the keys more than you would like uh, to make the notes come out. So that's kind of the same scenario. So we do see that a lot. Um, individuals doing maintenance and they'll use, you know, materials that are too thick or too squishy uh, or something like that. Oboe is really, there's really not much, not much room for forgiveness when it comes to things that feel squishy. So, and that can even be a pad, like, so we order our, our pads, our cork pads in bulk, uh, and in general, they're good. It's a really good product where we buy them from, but occasionally there'll be a pad that's in there and you get it and it just feels super soft. Like it's just softer cork material than, than all the other ones. And so, you know, a lot of times I'll just chunk that one because it just, a really soft pad on the oboe, the cork pads, they'll get those indentions um, really fast and then the pad starts leaking and it just it doesn't last very long. So squishy on an oboe is, is not good. Um, or uh, people that take their oboe parts to clean them and then they're sticking uh, stuff up the oboe that they shouldn't to clean. I mean, so you, always, you just don't want to scratch. You know, so like we use brushes to wash the instruments, but they're, they're not going to scratch anything. Uh, so you want to be mindful of, of scratching. Um, now, I will say, even though you, you don't want to hear this, but oboes are pretty resilient. We have seen some pretty good gouges in a bore from a screw or whatever where it didn't have a negative effect on tuning. Uh, it just depends on where it is and how deep it is or how wide it is. So if you were to do like a little hairline scratch in the bore, that's not going to actually, it's not going to do anything to the tuning. It's just going to make you mad that you did it, right? And so you don't want to, you know, but you want to stay away from that. Um, yeah, I don't, off the top of my head, I don't remember any other weird stuff that I've seen that people have done, but um, um, yeah, you just, just have to be mindful to anything you do, you want to think ahead, you know, is what I'm about to do going to do damage? Um, you know, there's always somebody that can fix something, but you might have to send it away at an unopportune time. Uh, I was always told that you don't pull the swab all the way through. I have a pull through swab and I pull it out most of the way. Mm -hmm. And then I like pull it back through a little bit mm -hmm. and like scrub it almost. Is that okay? Sure. And they probably told you that just so that you wouldn't get it stuck. Yeah. Because I got it stuck. Yeah. <laughs> Honesty. Honesty. They can be advantageous. Um, I don't do. I don't set up professional oboes in our shop with those. Um, in Nashville, we serve a lot of clients that record in studios, and Teflon tips are loud. It's it's a loud mechanism. Um, now, if you're playing on a stage with Teflon tips set up. Uh, and your audience, say you're in an orchestra and your audience members, you know, they're not going to hear that um, out in an audience. And you may not be able to hear it yourself over your act the actual playing of the oboe, uh, but in a studio setting, it's going to come through. Um, and so we set up, you know, our, our principle, our thoughts on that is we want an instrument to be as quiet as possible. And so, uh, you know, we now if, if you came to me with a Loray and said, "Hey, put Teflon tip screws on this," we're going to serve you in that that way. I will advise you not to, but if you still decide you want to, then I will do it. It actually can have a positive effect. So, like because the Teflon tips can be very firm, the adjustments can be like super exact, right? So. In that respect, it, it's a good thing. Um, I think uh, a lot of people think if they use all Teflon tips on their oboe, that it's, they'll never have to change an adjustment cork, right? Because it's the Teflon tip. And then with the same respect, you're not gonna have to go have maintenance as often. Well, what happens, and we see it all the time, is those Teflon tips, especially if they're a hair too long, every time you play them, those Teflon tips compress also but if they're too long, they'll like start to bend over. And so when you go to turn and make an adjustment, 
um, you could turn the screw clockwise to make an adjustment and it could have the negative effect. It could be almost as if you were to turn it counterclockwise. Um, and if you don't dome, so you would have to dome the end of the Teflon tip, because if you just, if you install a Teflon tip and just cut it, quote, flat, if it's not absolutely 100% perfectly flat, when you turn it, it could have the same, neg you could turn it clockwise and it could do the same thing if you turned it counterclockwise. So uh, when we do do them, uh, we spin them in the bench motor or whatever. We make sure there's a nice little dome so that the Teflon tip does come down to a point. Um, but the, the tip cannot be very long because uh, if it's long, it's, it's, it's going to compress and then even like slightly bend over. So I know Fox does that. I know uh, all Fox Oboes, even the new Cyan's and the, the, even the, the newest uh, Maple Cyan's, all Fox Oboes have Teflon tips. Um, and they, when they're set up right, like, yeah, they feel great. Um, and I love the new maple cyans that they're making, actually. Uh, those are surprisingly good. I mean, not surprising. I mean, the cyan's good, but um, you, you think of maple, maple oboe as being, like, super light and maybe a tinny sound or something, but this oboe is not that. Uh, it's really nice sound. So, um, so yeah, they can feel great. And then they can have positive things about it, but we choose not to just to make an oboe as quiet as possible. Well, I know if they don't cut the Teflon off square, it's a nightmare because it's like you say, you adjust it and instead of closing it down, yeah. suddenly it's like... Exactly. The results aren't always... Yeah. Yeah, so they, they do need to be domed if possible uh, or perfectly flat, which perfectly flat is... Uh, there's not really a definition for that. So like if the keys are angled and they're, they're, the keys are not, keys don't move straight up and down when they hit, right? So there's always like a lever motion. And so if you cut the Teflon tip perfectly flat, the key may arrive at this angle, which means the flat part's not touching the connecting key. So that's why the, the dome shape is, is more better because it's gonna come down to a point. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And all the wood oboes she sent had a humidifier in it, and she okay. recommended. Oh, the one, the little pillow thing yeah. she puts. Yeah. Those, do you recommend those if you have a wood oboe? A wet oboe? A wood. A wood oboe. <laughs> 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 if it's your oboe's wet, take the humidifier out. <laughs> um, you know, I've always recommended having humidifier. Oh, oh, are you okay? <laughs> yeah, I'm good. You okay? Yeah. We got that on tape. <laughs> <laughs> you sure you're okay? Yeah. Okay. I'm good. We're not going to embarrass you. It's okay. I fell the other day. I didn't see the stuff. <laughs> see, there's no yellow tape around that. I see a lawsuit. No yellow tape. Um, what was I answering? Humidifiers. Um, if you live in a dry climate, especially, so if you are a West Coast person uh, or mid, I don't know, Midwest, um, Arizona, those places, you definitely need to have humidifiers, right? Um, but in general, I, I've recommended that you always have a humidifier. Um, even if you play a lot, which could be six hours a day, uh, that means your oboe is in its case 18 other hours of the day. Okay, and so kind of the case is like home base. It's safety, and so kind of having a, a a standard, you know, humidified, consistent space for your oboe to live in. Consistency is good, and so in general, I don't have any. I can't prove anything I'm saying, but that's just kind of been my thought, train of thought, just trying to be simple and practical about it. Uh, if you live in Puerto Rico, you probably can get away with not having one. Okay. Uh, we do serve clients in Puerto Rico, and their instruments come in rusted because there's just, you know, a thousand percent humidity all the time. And it's just the rods, the springs, anything that's metal on those things um, can rust. And so, you know, you would not want to have one in that situation, more than likely. Um, but yeah, so Hannah is located in Arizona, and so hence she puts humidifiers in everything because her, 
her house where her shop is has like 5% humidity on a good day. Uh, she has humidifiers in her house, but it really doesn't touch it. It's just, that's what Arizona is. It's really, really super dry. Um, you know, here, uh, Middle Tennessee, where we live, you know, 50 to 70% humidity year round. It just depends on what time of year it is. So, yeah. You said you had two questions? I know cases wear out. Yep. Like, I know some Lorraine cases, like mm -hmm. sometimes they wear out and they start to damage the elbow. Yep. Is there like a particular kind of case you recommend? One that doesn't damage elbows. <laughs> like I have like the van case and my elbow seems like it's always going out of adjustment. Hmm. And I don't know if that's because of the case. Or the BAM case? Well, we can take a look at it. That sounds unusual, but it could happen. Um, yeah, so usually like the original wooden case, uh, leather lined wood cases, French style or, or otherwise that you get your oboe in. You know, if you were to play your oboe for a number of years, those cases do wear out. And we see the most damage happening from the lower joint. And it's again, those left hand levers, the low B, B flat. Um, so it'll wear out on the bottom and it'll, it'll get, you know, slightly wider and then usually uh, end to end play. And so you put your oboe in there thinking it's safe, but because there's so much uh, excess play in that slot, you close the lid and throw your oboe in a bag or carry it around, you know, and it turns upside down or whatever, you know, those levers can hit uh, the wood of, of the case. Um, and that's something we combat, you know, we, like I said, a lot of our business is shipping. And so we, we do a lot of packing on the inside of a case before we put anything in bubble wrap or peanuts or whatever. So we're always pre-packing on the inside of the case just for that. So yeah, thanks for bringing that up. That's a, an excellent point. Um, anybody has Howarth uh, oboes, like a Howarth XL or something, they make really great cases. Um, their intermediate cases, however, do wear out quickly. So like an S20, S40 case. So you do have to pay attention to those. Um, and then in general, any case that's made out of wood and has the fabric, it's gonna wear out. Um, BAM cases, like if it's all the foam stuff. So those shouldn't wear out in the same manner. But so if your oboe doesn't fit that particular case, great. Uh, it could be damaging it for sure. Um, what kind of oboe do you have? Yeah, so I had a BAM case with a Loray. I never had damage personally, but you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean you couldn't be having damage. So we can look at that after a while. Okay. So great questions. Yes, sir. You said you served a lot of studio players. Um, what do you think of cork versus like the different material uh, pad on the lower joints of the instrument? So the pads, so cork pads versus um, so we pretty much use cork for everything. Um, Lorets are good. Uh, if you have a Yamaha, Yamaha key cups are bigger. And so if you go cork on a Yamaha, they do seem to be a little louder because the louder, the bigger the cork pad gets, uh, just the more slapping it's going to do. Um, and so uh, I do sense that the Yamahas are louder. Um, but again, on a concert stage, nobody's ever going to hear that, um, especially your audience and members, but it could be picked up in a studio setting uh, with the microphones. Um, I don't typically use the leather. Uh, I do have them. If somebody really wanted them, I could install them. Um, I like to set up things so that they're as consistent and stable as possible. And I just find that that leather pads or skin pads, even even though I do a lot of Lauben work and we do skin padding like Lauben uh, likes, um, I just feel there's a lot of change in that material because underneath the, the leather is felt. And so felt is just going to react differently and quickly um, to the environment, especially if you're in a really humid environment. So, I mean, cork pads change too. Uh, there's nothing that doesn't change. All materials change. All materials change. So it just depends on how. And some of that is the technicians installing them. Uh, they can be installed where they're covering when they leave, but they can quickly uncover themselves. I mean, pads do change. So you know, there's, there's a few aspects of that. So I do not have a preference. I have a Yamaha Obo and it has cork pads. Actually, I think mine has skin. 
I bought it used. It's an older one. I bought it used because I don't play too much anymore. So it probably has the original skin pads in it. But because uh, if you buy a brand new professional Yamaha, they do come with skin pads for the low B and B flat. How does that affect the sound? How good are your reads? Medium. <laughs> I, I don't personally. Nick may have an opinion on that one. Uh, I, Do you find it noisy? Uh, which which the scenario? All I got has the low B and B flats have skin core pads. Are they noisier than skin pads? They are noisier than skin pads. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but they are noisier. Do yeah. Do studio musicians you work with have a preference? No, I mean, it's like, you know, if people play Loray and they come with cork pads, you know, I'm not changing cork pads out to skin or leather for someone. Nobody has requested that, so I'm, a, I'm assuming that's not an issue. I've, I've seen clarinet players ask for skin pads. Right. Well, so clarinet players, too, um, you know, those are larger pad cups on the bottom of a clarinet. And so, yeah, I've never installed or seen cork on the lower end of a, like say a regular b-flat clarinet and so there are um, leather pads uh, there's you know you may have heard of the valentino pads so there's a new version of valentino called a master's pad which are really excellent so uh, we've done a lot of uh, professional clarinet setup work with those um, but those make noise because they're such a great firm dense a foam product that they come down and they slap that tone hole and um, but again yeah I, I don't have an absolute answer for that one but uh, there could be you, you could hear that in recordings it's possible um, like on the albums where they have the cork pad and the skin pad like on the for the B flat and the uh -huh. And, and supposedly Lauvin says that um, there's a better um, distribution, whereas if you have cork and you have the hard cork on the, the uh, C hole and, and you're getting the ring hole on the A finger, that they say that that's very hard to um, regulate. But I would think having a skin pad and a cork pad, the skin pad doesn't compress at the same, same rate as the cork pad. Right. So, I just wonder what your opinion was on that. Uh, all scenarios are true. I mean, you're right. Uh, I, I don't have a, a strict opinion on that. Um, if you if you're doing a Lauben setup, and if you if you're not familiar, so Lauben sets they've always used cork uh, skin pads on the smaller, uh, so like your B flat and your C on the upper joint, your G sharp. Uh, and then the lower joint, almost everything except for the F sharp E and D. So the, the three main finger keys on the lower joint are cork. Everything else is skin on a Lauben. Okay. Uh, and so when you are regulating an instrument that has some cork and some skin, um, it's going to be different than if you regulate uh, cork and cork. Um, I, th I believe all materials change. So I think uh, their reasoning for using uh, skin pads um, is valid, but it's not always 100% true because cork pads change. I mean, they think cork pads change too much, but I also think skin pads change because of the felt. Oh yeah, I do a lot of Lauben setups and they're fantastic. It, Lauben's a different beast, um, yes. Yeah, skin pads seal amazing. It's all in the, the pad quality and how you install them. And so I've been doing um, doing work uh, with Lauben and for Lauben and for other customers that have Lauben's for uh, four or five years now. And it, it takes practice. My first ones were not so hot. Uh, so if you're used to setting up an oboe with all cork, and then you go to try to use skin pads, it's a completely different beast. And so it just takes time and practice to do it well. When it's done well, they seal amazing. Um, but again, all materials change. So I think the skin pads change. I think cork pads change. I know cork pads change. That's why we have to have maintenance done annually. Um, 
because those, those skin pads and cork pads get deep indentions uh, in the surface. Um, and that's one of the next thing, one of the next things I was going to talk about was, you know, the importance of general maintenance. We've, we've hinted at it, but if you learn how to adjust your oboe well and can do that, that's great. But after a while, uh, those cork pads and the skin pads, if you have them, they do get those deep indentions in them uh, from playing just normal pressure, even if you're not squeezing when you're putting the oboe together but normal finger pressure playing in uh, your daily practices and, and orchestra, um, those cork pads are gonna compress. And when that starts happening, uh, the adjustments go out and the, the pads start leaking themselves. So if you can imagine a pad that's perfectly flat on top of that tone hole, and then as it gets that deep indention, the, the pad is going further. Right, so that's what the indention is doing. The, the pad is going further, and so it's going to leak somewhere. A lot of times it's in the back, so if we're looking at angles, right, so the back of the pad might be a little bit leaky or whatever, or it could be the side, like if you press really hard on a key, and then knowing how and when to apply it, okay? Uh, try to not step on this oboe. <laughs> um, so uh, your oboe starts getting hard to put together. Uh, this oboe um, is not an awful shape. You know, you're doing good, but over time, uh, you, if you use cork grease, over time, we've talked about dust and dirt build up a lot. So it's also gonna get on the cork grease that you put on here, and it's gonna stay there. And then when you assemble um, the oboe, it's gonna kind of get embedded in the cork and it's just, just gonna stay there, right? And then if you put more cork grease on top of that, what's going to happen? Same process, right? More dust and dirt, more uh, grease and dirt compacting on there. And it's going to get darker and darker. Um, and that's just the dirt building up, okay? And so by doing that, over time, your oboe is going to start to get super hard to put together, even though you keep applying cork grease. Um, so. Uh, we recommend when you're going to apply cork grease to first clean off the old uh, first, okay? And you can simply do that, just a paper towel out of your kitchen. This is a blue shop towel thing from Walmart, right, in the automotive section. It's a little more sturdy than a... Thank you so much to make, help me make my pens. Nice. <laughs> so they're good, but cheap, right? All right, so you don't have to put any chemicals or anything on it, but just you can just use it dry and just a little bit of finger pressure, just clean that off. And this is not a really good example. You keep yours clean. <laughs> Let me see, the bell one may is not gonna be that way though. Let me see. Yeah, that one's nice and dirty. <laughs> Actually, it's not too bad. Um, Anyway, so very simple. Before you add more, try to take away the old, okay? Um, yeah, I mean, you can see a little bit. This one's really not bad at all, okay? But you can more or less just kind of see the cork grease residue, maybe a little bit of dust and dirt on there. Not super dirty. Um, you know, I've done this with many oboes where you do that and it's just like black, okay? And some of that is that the metal sockets can discolor as well. So it's not all like dust and dirt, but it could be from the metal itself. Uh, however, um, you should do, do this and wipe that away. And then when you apply fresh core grease, it's just gonna take a tiny, tiny bit and you wipe it around and it's gonna go on really nice and smooth and easy. And that, cause that uh, dust and dirt buildup over time is more like an abrasive, which is why your makes your instrument hard to put together, okay? So what type of cork grease do we recommend? Um, back in the day, pretty much the only choice was petroleum-based uh, cork greases, you know, decades ago, right? Nowadays in our modern society, there's lots of uh, synthetic cork greases, uh, natural uh, products out there. Um, you want to get something that does not have petroleum, that's not a petroleum base, okay? Um, it's really more uh, prominent now, so you, you shouldn't have a hard time finding that type of product, um, especially if you uh, are an Amazon lover like myself. Um, almost everything is there except for good oboe reeds. Um, 
what I've used in my shop the past 10, 15 years. Uh, you can't get it anymore, it's been discontinued. Uh, but there was a uh, shoe or boot polish called mink oil. Um, and it was basically mink oil, which is an animal. So that's why it was discontinued. Um, so whatever that is from that animal. But then they added uh, lanolin and like silicone or something. So it was all either natural or, or synthetic product. Um, and again, it looks like it's a boot polish in one of those round cans that you get at the store. Uh, but it's perfect cork grease consistency, uh, and it's it's natural. It's not a uh, not a petroleum based product, and so I still have a my little container that I've used for 15 years still has some in it. Unfortunately, you can't go buy that. So if you're looking um, and you go somewhere, you want to confirm that it's not a petroleum base. If you can ask the store, they may or may not know, um, or just search online for synthetic core grease and that'll probably take care of it so there's plenty of uh synthetic options out there um let's see well so somebody had a question over here question what's it okay um so i was going to demonstrate putting it on but basically um, whether it's like the little chapstick tube types uh, that you can get or like a little tub or a bigger tub um, I would just say put a little bit on your finger um, and then wipe it around. If you can see it on there after you're done wiping it, it's too much. Okay, anything that you can see is definitely going to ooze out when you put the joints together. Okay, and we talked about earlier uh, here downstairs, we talked about like your G-sharp pad sticking. Uh, we see that all the time, you know, uh, the younger kids that are told by their whoever to apply cork grease every time that they assemble, which is not necessary. Um, and it just, it just keeps coming out and, and they're not cleaning the old off first. So just a simple thing. It's kind of dumb, but you know, it's going to keep your pads from sticking. Uh, the other main reason though, actually, um, petroleum products. So these corks are, uh, where's cork come from? Trees. Tree. Tree. So as you can see from this cork, there's lots of little, uh, little black dots. Those are uh, the pores, the grains of the wood, right? And so anything you put on here and then you know, put the bell on, there's a lot of force there. That's gonna force that uh, cork grease down into the grains and eventually, theoretically, all the way through to where the glue is. And petroleum, uh, you know, like your oils and gasolines, that eats glue away. And so your uh, tenon cork potentially could come off way before it should, you know, the lifespan of the cork. So that's one of the biggest reasons we say stay away from the petroleum based stuff is just to kind of, you know, the, expand uh, the life of your corks. Um, I have yeah. Okay. It says can be used as gasoline in your car. Mm. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> Um, so this says patrol, patrol, let's see, patrol, a tum blanc. Um, oh wait, it's in English. Sorry. <laughs> White petroleum, white beeswax, paraffin, uh, menthol. So there's two things I'm not certain about. Uh -huh. So I might stay away from it until you could confirm what these products are. Okay. Yeah, um, Marigo. Yeah, so maybe uh, if you could get an explanation of what the petrol, pro, petrolatum, uh -huh. wait, petroleum white. That's probably like if you go to the drugstore and you get the uh, Vaseline. Vaseline. Mm. That's white, sort of. Mm -hmm. It's probably what that is. And if that's what that is, I would stay away from that. Some people do use Vaseline. You definitely don't want to use straight Vaseline, uh, for sure. Yeah. You're fine. Just switch and keep going. Okay. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I have a question about maintaining cork. You know how they have like the caps that you use? Do those matter? Should you use caps. them or not? Tenon caps. Oh, the tenon caps here? Yeah. So, the way I think about that is that if you put your oboe in the case without the tenon caps, it's way more loose. 
I think I haven't asked manufacturers directly. Maybe I will do that this week at Tampa finally. Um, but um, I think they're there to take up space and to make the joints tight in the case. Um, that's the way I would prefer to think about it. Some people think they protect the corks. They don't actually protect corks. However, if you do have excess cork grease, it could keep the cork grease from matting up your case. Right? It could keep the, the grease and the dirt off your case. So it could protect the case more than the cork itself. Or if you have cat fur, and then it sticks to the cork, right? Yeah. <laughs> what about compressing the cork? Is that a problem? It is a problem. So we get many new uh, instruments out of the factories where when I go to set them up, the cork, the tenon cap is so tight, I, it's really hard to get off. And so what that's doing is pre-compressing that cork. Um, so yeah, I, I feel tenon caps should basically, you pick the joint up, it should just fall off. That's the way I like mine. Um, and if they're on there in the case, again, it's just the way I think about it, it should just be there to kind of stabilize it in the case. Um, yeah, so we do, if we, if we get, and uh, if we get instruments that are tight, we usually uh, adjust those tenon caps so that they're not as tight. Um, and sometimes they're not tight when they come in the shop, but then we'll replace the cork and then they're too tight. So as an, as an oboe gets older, those joints get more wobbly. So sometimes you have to put thicker corks than say when it was a brand new oboe. And at that point, those tenon, uh, the tenon caps uh, would be too tight. And so we do make that adjustment in our shop. Uh, can spin them on the lathe basically and we just kind of cut some of the inside out. Oh, okay, so you can expand the inside. Right. Okay. Yeah. And very rarely, but it happens, one will shatter in the lathe, but yeah, we got your back. If we break one, we'll replace it. <laughs> you had your hand up first. Back to the Vaseline thing. So I know a lot of people that use it just for like the quirks on their reeds. Is that okay or not? Theoretically, you shouldn't have to use, like I've never done that myself. I've never used a core grease for an oboe reed. Um, if they are super, super tight like that, um, I would just recommend having your teacher or somebody lightly sand it maybe. Um, typically that's not an issue, right? I mean... Um, Sometimes on a new cork it can be yeah. tight. Reed yeah. vary so much. That's yeah. true. So, I mean, in Fox, before I retired, they said they were going to make it bigger hmm. because um, they were getting the bites, but... And some of the makers make the staples oversized. I mean, the, the cork is. A lot of people yeah. use cork racer. Sometimes they use like the little things of Vaseline to like set cost of So, if someone wants to use cork grease on their reeds, mm -hmm. again, I don't recommend it. You should find, figure out the reason that's happening and, and fix that. So, whether it's the staples, uh, the tube is, the tube, the cork is too big. Uh, they can easily be adjusted, um, you know, somebody with some sandpaper. However, if you do need to do it or want to do it, I would not use Vaseline. It would be the same principle. Um, and you would, and so again, it would be even more of the same principle. If you put it on and you can see it, it's way too much because you keep pulling the reed in and out and where's that core grease is going to end up down in the reed well and then it's going to get pushed into the bore and then you've got core grease clogging the bore and you definitely, that definitely attracts dust. Yeah. Plus it's gonna close the bore up and then your tuning is gonna be all out of whack. You probably won't even be able to play, honestly, it's if it gets bad. Natural. What's that? Synthetic yeah, yeah, that'd be the same for sure. Yeah. Do you have any suggestions on how to keep your silver looking nice longer? Sure. Um, um, there's a few reasons. So some people's uh, body chemistry uh, allows for, for keys to tarnish faster than other people. Um, if you are a person that has a more acidic uh, body nature, I don't know how you describe that, I'm not a biologist, but um, you would want to wash your hands frequently before practicing um, as, as much as, all, as often as possible. Um, I used to, several years ago, I had a client who, they, they were so acidic, like I had to do full disassembly cleaning on their oboe twice a year because just over the period of a few months, 
all the spaces like where the uh, the keys meet the posts you know that's exposed raw metal there and so like the green corrosion would form and the keys would just start binding up they were that acidic it was crazy um, so if you're that person you should wash your hands as often as possible okay and then on top of that uh, I would recommend getting a uh, some type of microfiber cloth um, it doesn't have to be a silver polished cloth but you could just get a, a nice microfiber cloth that's not supposed to scratch and just whenever you get done playing and you don't have to do it every time but you know maybe every few days or something you could simply wipe away all your fingerprints any any evidence of where you've touched the oboe uh, you could use that cloth to wipe it away um, and hopefully keeping the fingerprints off will help uh, prevent some of that tarnish from building up uh, but tarnish is oxidation it's going to happen at some point and some people it happens more than others um, so very lightly wiping it down with a regular cloth is good uh, of course they do make silver polished cloths uh, which have uh, the chemical in it um, to to uh, polish the silver those are great too but sometimes they're dusty the cloth from the from the chemical that's in it so you want to be careful you know of how much you do that and and if you start seeing a bunch of dust collecting on your body of the oboe um, you would want to maybe get a can of compressed air from the office store and you can blow it off that way or probably blow it off just blowing on it with your mouth uh, would be okay as well um, and then they do make uh, those little silver strips you may have seen them in in people's cases i know howarth oboes they put them in there from the factory standard and they're just like little uh, silver sheets of paper well they're not silver they're you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Little sheets of paper that help uh, prevent uh, silver from tarnishing. Um, and so you could try that. Although I have had instances where clients, that's it. So there's a, yeah, 3M makes that stuff. Um, but in super, super duper um, moist climates, I have seen where those papers have uh, made the tarnish worse. And so I've had, had clients that I've recommend that they remove the paper and, and wait for a few days or weeks to see what happens and it actually fixed the problem. So I think there are some certain situations where that could be negative. Um, yeah, so again, washing your hands a lot um, and then just lightly wiping fingerprints away could definitely preserve uh, silver. Uh, and then some of you won't have an issue at all. Uh, and then others of you, will so i heard that if you get like a cheap painter's brush from michael's or something and you use it and to get the dust out in between your keys is that okay it is okay if you know how to reinstall springs okay <laughs> so the only negative effect of that is to to do what you're saying you have to get the bristles down for like one of the foam ones oh uh, i don't know if that would work like dust or something so that would only work like back here where it's completely exposed but like if there's dust down under all these keys in here the foam would not get down in there um, so just blowing on it you would have better uh, heard people say that results really yeah so if, but if you got like a super cheap uh, bristle brush uh, there's like a regular paint brush that's soft uh, Okay, yeah, little makeup brushes. Uh, yeah, there's lots of options. Um, you could get down in there if you want to, to do that. I would first try blowing on it or the compressed air route, okay? Uh, but if you use the brush, the, uh, what could happen, there's all these little metal steel needle, uh, needle springs under, the, under there, and you could pop that out of place, and then your keys not operate properly. So then you would have to do some detective work to see what happened. And if you're good with that or that possibility, uh, then by all means. But, you know, I think in general, like if you had a can of compressed air and you just kind of blew it off like once a week, you're going to be good. Oh, but don't make oboe reeds with the oboe in your lap. <laughs> hmm. Not only does it get super dusty, those larger shavings that you don't see get under the pad surface and will get between the pad and the tone hole and then your 
pads are leaking because of uh, cork dust and cork shavings. Do not make reeds over your oboes. Okay, yes. I have like a problem with the compressed air thing because now if you go to like, I tried to buy compressed air once and they were like, you're not 19 so you can't buy compressed air. So if you're younger than 19, you've got a problem. <laughs> I don't think, you don't mean yeah. that kind of compressed air. Or She's talking like for is a, that, is that not the like case? a paintball gun or something, those mm -hmm. tanks. Oh yeah, no. No, 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 you can't buy those unless you're 19. Those little cans? Yeah. It's because like, somebody, somebody started buying a bunch of them and they forgot to switch to the and they were making some of them. Oh, there it is. Because I went to go buy compressed air with my mother and, and he's like, can I see your ID? And I was like, what? Yeah, you can't So buy you can't buy these? No. So <laughs> until you're an adult. I've heard that there's a black market for these. <laughs> <laughs> it's called find an adult to go into the convenience mart and buy your compressed air for you. <laughs> it is kind of sad what we've come to, right? Um, so yeah, I would definitely do that. Is there a um, danger from the coldness of the air coming out of the can? It could be, like, yeah, so if you do it, and sometimes it, like, it freezes, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I would com uh, recommend hold the can vertical. Um, so don't hold it sideways or, or horizontal. Don't do up and down because you can make like water. You don't want to shake it. So just, and you might want to do a test squirt. And then if you just hold the trigger down and it just is going continuously, it will do that. So just like, ch -ch 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 should be, should be powerful enough to do that. Yeah. Um, so we're soon out of time and you guys have been amazing and asked lots of awesome questions and so that's been made it like super fun for me. I appreciate that. Um, I'm sorry? We'll talk afterwards. Um, uh, blah, 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 blah. So yeah, we talked about general maintenance. I think you guys get the idea. There's lots of stuff that can go wrong with this. So one of the last things, um, I think soon after this we're going to lunch, right? Uh, what do you do after lunch and you got to play your oboe? Brush Man, all right, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so one of the first and, and most important things that you guys can do to help prevent all kinds of mayhem is to brush your teeth. Uh, or if you can't do that, really wash your mouth out with water um, or something like that. Because we're all drinking beverages, um, mostly uh, the almost unless you're drinking like just straight up coffee or a water, most all beverages have some form of sweetener in them. Um, so anytime you eat something or drink something, especially sweet, it's going into your horn, okay? Just like the microscopic dust particles on your swab that you can't see, that stuff's coming out of your mouth, uh, going in your reeds, which probably means you need to clean your reeds too. I don't know, that's not my department, but that's probably a thing, right? Uh, clean your reeds if you have one that's you played for a while. Um, but yeah, all of that stuff that you ingest, it goes in your horn. So as, as clean as you can be, um, that will help the oboe stay super clean as well. So that goes back to what we just talked about, uh, washing your hands. Uh, that'll help uh, with fingerprints and acidity and, and tarnish. Uh, but then also it starts on the inside of your body out this way. Um, so awesome, uh, you, you know, it's sticky stuff uh, gets in there and then pads don't open. And there's lots of reason a pad may not open or close properly, um, but we don't need to do that uh, with our actions. So stuff's gonna go wrong anyway. So any last, last minute questions? I know there's people that they can touch the elbow and they'll they can touch the silver and it's like, it's been polished. I'm envious of those people. Right. I'm the kind that I can touch the wood and in a few days it'll start turning brownish grayish. It looks like all the oil starts. Yeah. I'm like, I always eat up the silver on it. Nice case. It's just, even if I wipe them off, and I'm really envious of the people who can have an elbow four or five years and it looks brand new. Yeah. And the wood looks new. Yeah. The keys look wonderful. 
and with me, you look at my elbow, and it's dusty and stuff, but it looks like it's quite a hard line. Yeah. So we get seen up and stuff. So, again, there's no way to completely prevent that. Um, but washing your hands a lot and wiping the elbow down will help, but it's not 100% for sure. And then he had an operation, and all of a sudden he became a publisher. And I don't remember if he took out his gallbladder or his appendix or something, but all of a sudden he was able to not eat up his elbow. Well, don't go having a bunch of stuff removed. I do not recommend gallbladder surgery. <laughs> If you have tarnish on your elbow. <laughs> so I'll turn it back over to Julie. I think it's close to time, maybe. Yeah, or it's I, about time for um, lunch, But I just need to see. Well, first of all, before I say that, let's thank you. <clears throat> thank you, guys. <laughs>